If you torture data long enough, it will confess to anything. That's why I brought my spiked baseball bat. I've been lying to people with baseball statistics for about four years now, and the usual tricks don't always work. For example, nowadays people know to be wary of charts. Here's a chart that makes it look like the Dodgers won twice as many games as the Astros last year. That's what you can do when the y-axis doesn't start at zero. Or you could be even more daring. Here's a chart using the rare double y-axis, giving the impression that Jeff Mathis was actually a better hitter than Barry Bonds. In my mind he was, but the chart is misleading. Indeed, the real trick to lying is to not lie at all. That's why I espouse the use of technical truths. These are baseball stats that are technically true, but make a point that's totally false. In 1968, the Boston Red Sox pitched to a team earned run average of 3.33. In 1999, they had an ERA of 4 flat. And given that both Red Sox teams pitched in the same ballpark, Fenway, we can easily say that the 1968 team's pitching staff performed better. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret here. I'm lying to you. I'm Big Fat Liar, starring Paul Giamatti. In 1968, the mound was 30 feet high and the baseball was drenched in applesauce. This isn't a lie, it's hyperbole. So, the American League average ERA was a measly 2.96, nearly two runs below the 1999 average when hulking sluggers like Rafael Palmeiro, Jose Canseco, and Jason Giambi invented cheating in baseball. Yearly fluctuations in the run environment can be a goldmine for liars. A 4 ERA would be terrible in the year of the pitcher, but excellent in the height of the steroid era. The antidote to these poisonous lies? Stats like ERA+, Plus, which compare an ERA to the league average for any given year. 100 is always average, and higher is better. In 1968, the Red Sox had an ERA plus of 96, slightly below average by 1968 American League standards. In 1999, their ERA plus was 126. They had the best ERA in the American League, thanks in large part to the efforts of Pedro Martinez, who had the 8th best single season ERA plus before setting the modern record the following year. One current player who has experienced major fluctuations firsthand is Nolan Arenado. In 2022, Arenado had an amazing year at the plate with 30 homers and an OPS of 891, yet it failed to live up to the heights of his 2019 season. Or did it? 2019 was the height of the juiced ball era when four teams shattered the single season home run record. And Arenado was a Colorado Rocky at the time, meaning he could double dip the high run environment by playing in course. Once again, we have to turn to a plus stat for the truth. This time, the antidote is OPS plus. Same concept. 100 is average, higher is better. In 2019, Nolan Arenado had a 315 batting average, 379 on base, and 583 slugging for a 962 on base plus slugging and 131 OPS plus. In 2022, in a lower league wide run environment, playing in a pitcher's park in St. Louis, his raw stats were less impressive, but his OPS plus was way better at 154. This was a career year, even though it wouldn't immediately look like it on paper. Here's another good one. In 2007, CeCe Sabathia was a 26-year-old power pitcher averaging 95 miles per hour on his fastball en route to his only career Cy Young award. In 2019, he was a 38-year-old on one good knee, throwing a fastball under 90 miles per hour, yet the hobbled Sabathia somehow struck out hitters at a higher rate than his prime. What gives? The league trended up in strikeout rate between those years. It's okay when I do it. Meaning Cy Young CC struck out hitters at a rate 26% higher than league norms, while stick a fork in me I'm done CC was perfectly average. Let's get back to Arenado though, because while he experienced a mid-career home ballpark change, it's also important to note that the ballparks themselves can change. 
That's what happened to Ryan Mountcastle, who hit 33 homers in 2021, but just 22 the following season, after his Orioles pushed the left field fences back, creating a graveyard for Ryan Mountcastle's hopes and dreams. It would be a lie to say his power declined. His power actually improved in terms of exit velocities and barrel rates. Instead, his opportunities declined. Run environment matters because you can use it to lie about baseball. Sample size. It's not just the thing I'm arguing with Costco employees about. It's a tool you can use to mislead unsuspecting baseball fans. Ian Happ is a better pitcher than Jacob deGrom. The facts are undeniable. His career ERA of zero absolutely trounces deGrom's. Thankfully, deGrom has other talents outside of pitching, as his batting average in 2021 was 55 points higher than NL MVP Bryce Harper's. Hopefully you see what's happening. The sample is too small. Ian Happ has pitched one career inning. Jacob deGrom had 33 at-bats in 2021. The antidote is a larger sample size. For example, I've been kicked out of five different Costco locations for stuffing dozens of free samples down my pants, but I'll have to do it at at least 20 more Costco locations before I can be sure that they hate me. The same logic goes for baseball. Make Ian Happ throw 100 innings and his ERA will look like a position player's. DeGrom, meanwhile, has a career OPS plus of 35 across 423 plate appearances. But how can you know when a sample size is legit? It depends on the stat. Metrics like ERA and batting average take a long time to stabilize. Ideally, you'd have a multi-season sample to draw conclusions from. At the end of April 2022, Eric Hosmer had a 389 batting average. For the rest of the season, he hit 240 despite no real change in strikeout rate, walk rate, or exit velocity. The difference came from BABIP, batting average on balls in play. His April batting average was just another small sample outlier. Yet, at the same time, Jordan Alvarez was swinging at more pitches in the zone and chasing fewer pitches outside the zone in April 2022 compared to his previous career norms. And because his swing decisions improved, his strikeout rate and walk rate then dramatically improved, leading to a monster year. So why was Hosmer fake and Alvarez legit? Alvarez's sample was larger, healthier, and more nutritious. Hosmer's batting average sample was 72 at bats, or 57 balls in play, but the denominator for Jordan Alvarez's swing metrics was pitches, of which he saw 254 in April. The 16 games Jordan played that month sound like an impossibly small sample to draw conclusions from, but 254 of something? That sounds more legit because it is more legit. Now here's a good lie. I present to you two gritty American League second basemen, Craig Biggio and Dustin Pedroia. For their careers, Dustin Pedroia had a higher on-base plus slugging, but their years in MLB hardly overlapped, so we'll show that we know better by using OPS+. Alrighty, Pedroia was the better hitter by one point. Or was he? In this case, Pedroia is benefiting from a stat that's measured on a rate basis. Batting average on base percentage, slugging, OPS, and OPS plus aren't counting stats like hits, home runs, and RBI. Pedroia wins the rate stat battle because he didn't have any old guy decline years. He was basically done after age 33, playing in only 9 games beyond that. Biggio, meanwhile, held on until he was 41 to reach 3,000 career hits. Good for the counting stats, but bad for the rate stats. The truth is, Biggio appears to be the better hitter of the two if you examine their stats through their respective age 33 seasons. This is why you should always consider a player's total career and their peak. For what it's worth, Pedroia was the better defender. We're taught to believe that stats are objective and unfeeling, but some are subject to human discretion. You are now watching bad outfield plays that aren't errors. See that? Not an error. How about this one? Still not ruled an error. But surely this one, right? Nope. Somehow, that is a hit. 
In 2022, Nick Castellanos had a perfect fielding percentage, which did not match his less than perfect reputation with the glove. Contrast that with Stephen Kwan, who won the gold glove in left field during his wonderful rookie year, but committed a few errors in doing so. In fact, when he misplayed a Franchi Cordero drive to deep left field, that made it a 4-0 ball game. Of course, Stephen Kwan is a better defender than Nick Castellanos, but you could use fielding percentage to mislead the sabermetrically illiterate. Depending on the era, advanced defensive metrics like total zone, defensive runs saved, and currently, stat cast outs above average paint a better picture of defensive contributions. This is my pride flag. So let's try this. Ken Griffey Jr. was worth negative 42 defensive runs saved in center field during his career, meaning he was a poor defender. Once again, I am poisoning you with baseball stats that are only technically true. Here's the antidote. Defensive runs saved is only measured from 2003 onwards, meaning we only have it for the back third of Griffey's career, when he was 33 and had already accrued many injuries. It does not include his Mariners years, where he won 10 consecutive gold gloves in center. Admittedly, some of those gold gloves were won more with the wood than the leather, but if you look at a stat which can be measured throughout Griffey's career, in this case total zone, he was worth plus 6 total zone runs in center. And even that total is brought down by the bad years in Cincinnati. Between 1993 and 1997, he was the third most valuable defender in MLB thanks to plus 80 total zone runs in just five seasons. Here's another one. Albert Pujols was worth negative 10 outs above average at first base throughout his career. Here's the anecdote. I saw a beaver crossing the road once. Now here's the antidote. Outs above average data is only available since 2016, back when Albert Pujols was 63 years old. Sorry, I meant 36. If you look at Total Zone for his first couple seasons, followed by defensive run save for the rest of his career, he's perhaps the greatest defensive first baseman in MLB history. Sadly, some sort of stat cast zoomer might believe that Albert Pujols wasn't an all-time great first baseman, or that he <gasps> played for the Angels. Okay, here's a good one. Last season, Freddie Freeman was worth more stat cast outs above average than his teammate Trey Turner, making him the more valuable defender. Except, there exists a little something called the defensive spectrum, which tries to adjust to the relative difficulty of positions. Trey Turner playing a league average shortstop is ultimately more valuable than Freddie Freeman's above average first base. If Freddie Freeman could play shortstop, the Dodgers would happily stick him there. And to all my first base lovers, the defensive spectrum exists, but you don't always have to agree with it. I always felt like catchers get to cheat because they always know what pitch is coming. Because they called it. Let me tell you about one of the all-time great hitters in MLB history. They had a higher career batting average than Ricky Henderson, higher on base percentage than Cal Ripken Jr., higher slugging than Joe Morgan, more hits than Lou Boudreaux, more homers than Wade Boggs, more walks than Roberto Clemente, and more steals than Joe DiMaggio. That player is Jeff Conine, who had a wonderful career but understandably dropped off the Hall of Fame ballot without receiving a single vote in 2013. The lie at work here deals with player profiles, and it's best achieved with a stat head membership. Foolish 20 for 20% 20 off. For example, Ricky Henderson was a career 279 hitter, which is impressive, but he also walked over 2,000 times to give him a more important 401 on base percentage. His on base skills weren't just about getting hits. Wade Boggs was a phenomenal hitter, but didn't hit too many long balls. Almost 800 hitters have more career home runs than him. One important concept is that the relative strength of the league itself can fluctuate. Before the American and National Leagues were integrated, there were 21 instances in which a hitter had at least a 200 OPS plus and 10 wins above replacement in a season. From Hannes Wagner in 1908 to Ted Williams in 1946. Since integration in 1947, there have only been 9, the most recent of which was Aaron Judge's legendary 2022 season. Are the superstars of yesteryear better than the superstars of today? No, but they were technically more dominant because they played when the talent pool was shallower. 
today's average and replacement level players are much more competent than the ones that played 100 years ago, making it harder to lap the competition. 10 war in 2022 is more impressive than 10 war in 1922, even if the value is ultimately the same. You know what else can change? The priorities of the players themselves. This is the story of the saddest final season in MLB history. His name was Roy Cullenbein. The year was 1947. As Hank Greenberg's replacement for the Tigers, at the age of 33, he had a 224 batting average, putting him at 89th out of 93 qualified batsmen that season. But he money balled out. Thanks to a monstrous 137 walks, he had a 401 on base percentage, good for 9th among qualified hitters. In July, Colin Bine drew a walk in 22 consecutive games, an MLB record that still stands today. Sadly, those elite on-base skills weren't appreciated in their time. Kohlenbein hit 224 when hitters were judged primarily by their batting average. The Tigers released him that offseason, the Phillies snagged him off waivers, and when an overweight Kohlenbein showed up to spring training, he lost his roster spot to future Hall of Fame rookie Richie Ashburn. As such, 1947 was Roy Kohlenbein's final season. By war, it's the sixth most valuable final season by any hitter in MLB history. The others on this list stopped playing for a variety of reasons, including voluntary retirement, lifetime banishment because of the Black Sox scandal, and sadly, even death. But Roy Kohlenbein is the only player on here whose career seemingly ended for performance reasons. This demonstrates the pitfalls of assigning modern sabermetric understandings to players from past generations. Throughout most of professional baseball history, you'd be recognized more for a 280 batting average than a 380 on base percentage and likely compensated accordingly. That's not to say we can't celebrate the then underappreciated approach of Roy Cullenbein, a man way ahead of his time. But it also means we must respect the choices of the no-walk, no-power guys who pursued empty batting averages, even if today's analytics aren't as kind to them. So there you have it, an exhaustive guide of how to lie with baseball statistics. But you should only use these tools for good. And by for good, I mean, of course, only for winning arguments on the internet. Big, big thank you to my newest patrons for supporting what I do. To see your name here, head on over to patreon.com slash foolishbaseball. 